Good morning, everyone. It's Mary Ann from the New York City Organization of Public Service Retirees. I want to share with you the video from last week's oral arguments at court. Um, many of you have seen it on social media, but others haven't. So I want to be able to share it with you and then explain to you what's next. It's about a 20 minute video from court. It was really very brief. And then that will give you um, an idea of where we stand and how the arguments went. And uh, we'll probably be taking your questions uh, during the next Friday night update. But it was really kind of self-explanatory. And if you're on our, self, our social media, we have been answering your questions there as well. And I did a live re recap in our social media that night. Um, it's not on YouTube, but it is on, so on Facebook. So if you're in our page, you can go there, which is one reason why I'm doing this. So let's watch the video. Eight and two and seven. Everett versus Equinox is a submit. Ward versus City of New York is a submit. And Philippin versus City of New York is a submit. Uh, I'm going to call Bentakowski versus City of New York out of order. I am recused on the case. If, if there is a tie, uh, the court will follow the appellate division first department's a protocol in vouching in another judge. You may proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, your honors. May it please the court. I'm Richard Deering for the city of New York. Justice Frank's injunction should be reversed. I want to start, if I can, with the promissory estoppel claim. This court's decisions in New York law is- Could you, I, I have a question. The affidavit of Lillian Barrios Paoli, who had a long history in city government, stated that the city's promise, promise of Medicare with a city paid supplemental plan was a, quote, essential recruiting and retention tool, close quote. I didn't see anything in your papers that disputed that that was an essential recruiting and retention tool. Could you show me where, if anywhere in the record, you, refu you refuted that? We refute, I think, the, uh, the premise that that promise was, ever, was made and, and- Well, but she says the promise was made and that that promise was an essential recruiting and retention tool. Do you address that specifically in your papers? I just want to return to my point. The, the SPD, it, it, her affidavit hinges on a passage from the SPD and we have explained why that SPD does not amount- I don't think that's all her. She, I understood her affidavit to rely on her statement of the city policy with regard to recruiting and retaining employees, not limited to what was in the SPD, but rather limited to what it was her policy as director of HRA, among other things, to convey to new employees. So I don't see it as being that limited. Well, it's bound up very much in the SPD on my reading of the affidavit, but I think the more, the more, maybe the more helpful point for your purposes is that this is a, it is a legal question, whether there was a clear and unambiguous promise made. We have to look at I'm them. aware it's a legal question, counsel. That's why I asked you that question. Well, sure. We have to look at the evidence of what, what, what the words that were stated, not what someone's characterization. Counsel, it's interesting that in this case, you had the opportunity to, dis to do discovery, but you chose to forgo that and instead to ask the court to rule on the permanent injunction request based on the record that was developed. So I'm asking, in the record that was developed, where did you refute that that was a retention and recruitment tool? I have no doubt that, that the, the commitment that the city has continued to make of of free health care coverage into retirement for retirees and their dependents is a recruiting tool. The question whether the promise that is characterized by Ms. Barrios Paoli was actually the promise made under the courts and the New York law standards for promissory estoppel is a question that she cannot resolve by a conclusory statement. We have to look at the words communicated 
and make that assessment under the president. So where of this did you refute that in your paper? You have done it by 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 looking at the actual words and explaining why that they, they do not equate to any such promise or to any such clear and unambiguous promise under the court's precedence. Condor funding, prospect funding, it is clear that the, the that there must be no other way to understand a promise than than the way uh, that is the predicate of the promissory estoppel claim. And this simply isn't true. I think we are quite, quite some distance from that. Um, the passage relied on fundamentally was a high level description of, this, of the city's program after, after individuals became Medicare eligible, mainly, mainly a, a warning that folks would need to make sure they enrolled in Medicare um, rather than continuing to rely on city benefits as the sole source of benefits. And nothing in that passage indicated that it was a lifetime or promise or that it couldn't change. Petitioners admit that everything else virtually in those SPDs, co-pays, deductibles, pl plan benefits, everything else was subject to change, not only was subject to change, but did change. Am I say correct that, that a significant part of the city's impetus for this change was to save money? It's to, yes, to confront a spiraling, I think we all are aware that healthcare costs are spiraling so in this country. How do you rebut the statement by the city's independent budget office that putting retirees into Medicare Advantage would not provide the city with actual budgetary savings as shown in the record? I don't, I don't, I honestly just don't understand the statement. The, the, the fundamental reality of budgeting is that. So where did you rebut that in the record? Well, we have shown, well, I'll put it this way. We have shown that, the, that this move to mirror the existing senior care benefits level through a Medicare Advantage plan will result in an annual savings of 500 to 600 million dollars. That I don't think is disputed uh, for the purpose of this case. Where will the five to 600 million dollars go? Will it go well, to just, the general I, operating fund? Will it go to some other earmarked? Well, all other our budgetary products? funds are, I, I don't think it's earmarked. Our, our funds, our budgetary funds are, uh, these funds are fungible. The, the reality of budgeting in the city of New York or, and any other governmental or, or household or any other budget is that money that is not saved is either uh, either results in a cut to some spending that would otherwise occur or, or you have to raise new revenue through taxes. And there's nothing different about this situation than any other potential budgetary savings. Um, I do want to draw a, a, a specific contrast because I think it's helpful from the kind of language you see in the cases that the petitioners rely on, not even cases applying, mind you, the clear and unambiguous standard of New York law that find a lifetime promise. That's cases like Devlin and Abruscato, where the language said, we will pay for this benefit for the rest of your life, or described it explicitly, quote unquote, as a lifetime benefit. The case of Immerling, uh, upstate New York case that said, uh, we will pay for this benefit until your death. That's the kind of language you see when, when a, a promise, a, 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 what is really a rare promise of lifetime benefits is found by the court, and that's not even applying the clear and unambiguous standard that New York applies to promissory estoppel. And to put, just to put a fine point on a recent holding of the Court of Appeals that I think is very important, which is the Donahue case that, that addressed vesting of retiree health care benefits through the lens of collective bargaining. They said, and, and of course we are engaged in one of the most sophisticated collective bargaining efforts here in the city of New York, the, the Municipal Labor Committee, as laid out in Mr. Klinger's amicus brief, has overwhelmingly supported this move. But that union doesn't represent retirees, does it? It represents tens of thousands of employees who will be retirees will be and be retirees. retirees soon. And that's very significant. At, at time, I'm, I'm going to be a retiree but, soon, but too. But there was no one present at the negotiation who had a current interest in retirees, correct? Absolutely not true. There, there, that the MLC has I'll make two points. I'm sorry, but they don't have any members who are retirees, right? Well, I think the UFT does have actually a chapter that is composed of retirees. The MLC, which was present at the negotiation, does it have any members who are retirees? The MLC is an umbrella committee, so it has UFT and other unions within it. I, I, I honestly can't, I do not know the answer to that question. But what I do know is that they have many members who will be retirees, including next week, next month, next year. They have shown themselves over time to be deeply committed to preserving retiree health care. In fact, the savings that have been generated over years have, have led with, with adjustments to active health care and, ch and changes to retiree health care have been deferred as long as possible. I, I see your honor. So the, the SPDs, did they consistently over the years state that the retiree would get the Medicare plus supplemental insurance? Not to, not to my, not in my awareness. They, they said that the city's 
plan did not duplicate benefits available under Medicare. That's essentially the, the crux <laughs> of the promise that, 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 that is alleged here by the petitioners, but I, I don't think there was anything that explicit. There was definitely nothing that distinguished in, that, in, in the SPD between one type of Medicare plan explicitly versus another or said, we guarantee you that at least one plan will always be this kind. You won't see that language in the SPD. What you see is a general description of what happens once you become Medicare eligible that encompasses the entirety of the city's offerings, which for years have included direct funded plans and for years have included Medicare Advantage plans and doesn't draw specific distinctions between those or say we guarantee that at least one of these is going to be around. And, and I honestly think even more clearly than that, nothing in the SPD says uh, this is a permanent immutable aspect of the program. When petitioners concede, everything else can change. They think they say this is the one island in the sea of change. Not everything, not just everything else has changed, but every not just everything else can change, but everything else has changed repeatedly. SPDs over the years document those changes. That this one thing couldn't, but there's no box drawn around this provision. There's no star drawn around it. There's no just be aware this one thing is different from everything else. There's nothing like that. So the one thing that hasn't changed at least up until 2023 was the availability of that Medicare plus supplement. It had not changed yet, but that is very different. That's a, that's a description of a practice that is not the same thing as a clear and unambiguous promise that it wouldn't change. And I think that distinction is really at the heart of this case and at the heart of the error made by Justice Frank below. That what has to happen for a, a, you know, a promissory estoppel is disfavored in New York. It is a stringent standard that needs to be met and it requires a clear and unambiguous promise not an inference. Even if that promise was used as a basis for recruiting and retaining employees who earned far less than they would have in the private sector, but chose to go to work for the city because of the promise of this. Well, so that doesn't that doesn't make any difference in the calculus of promissory estoppel. Well, we we dispute that that promise was made. That's the whole argument I'm making here. There's two distinct ele elements. There's more than two, but two that we're talking about right now. One is a clear and unambiguous promise. That's what the focus of this argument is. A separate argument, a separate element is reasonable reliance. That's a separate aspect of the claim. But the two are not to be jumbled. And I just want to just to circle back briefly to the Donahue case, where the court talked about vesting of retiree health benefits specifically in the context of collective bargaining, in context of a situation where the allegation was this union doesn't represent me, and I need these these benefits to be recognized as vested. And the court said explicitly, traditional contract principles control. They, they repudiated the idea that there should be policy-based inferences favoring vesting of those benefits based on considerations around the employment relationship. They said to do that would undermine the stability of contracting in New York, specifically in reference to the collective bargaining relationship. And as we have shown here, we have a very well-developed collective bargaining relationship, and the MLC has overwhelmingly supported this change. Petitioners don't even argue that any collective bargaining agreement uh, for, forbids it. Any other questions? One more. I'm just curious. This has circles back to something Justice Gessmer touched on earlier. In the face of the evidence that was adduced by the plaintiff's petitioners, the affidavit of Ms. Barrios, the affidavits of, of, of Legion retirees, why didn't you put in any evidence? And if it's in there, I'm sorry, you, you'll point me point me to it. Why why, why couldn't you produce any evidence, even in the face such as one affidavit from one supervisor, one administrator, someone refuting that that the, the promises of the sort um, alleged by the plaintiffs and and supported by Ms. Barrios's affidavit and the affidavits of the retirees, that, that those promises weren't made. There wasn't one individual in city government over that course of 57 years who could say we, such a promise was not made. I don't think there's not such a person. I think we, we, we looked at the record and we concluded that, that the evidence of that promise under the, under the standards of New York law was not sufficient. And, so and you simply decided it wasn't necessary to refute it. I think, I think what we decided was when you look at the text, which is the, which is the controlling question, the text of the S SPD, it does not come close to the neighborhood of a clear and unambiguous promise of lifetime benefits. And it, just to put, if I could put a brief fine point on the issue of like oral statements You'll and other documents, there is no wait. evidence of the content of those things, or virtually none. Thank you. Your honors, and may it please the court, 
Jake Gardner on behalf of the retirees. I apologize for my, my voice. Uh, Your Honor, I have a very simple answer to your question. The reason why, in the face of hundreds of affidavits from retirees and former city officials saying that there was a clear and unambiguous promise of Medicare plus supplemental insurance given for 57 years, the reason why the city didn't submit a single affidavit from any current city official or former city official is because no one would say under penalty of perjury that there was no promise made, nor would they say that any promise made was unauthorized. So I think the fact that you have hundreds of affidavits from retirees and former city officials, including Ms. Barrios Paoli, who was the person who had all this knowledge for 25 years. She served as the deputy mayor of Health and Human Services. She headed the Department of Employment, Department of Personnel, and Department of Aging. They all said that there was a clear and unambiguous promise delivered by city officials in virtually every setting, verbally, in person, and then also in HR documents and SPDs. And what, sir, was the specific clear and unambiguous promise? It was very simple. It was, if you spent uh, your career serving the city, when you became Medicare eligible and retired, you would get uh, health care, city-funded health care in the form of Medicare plus supplemental insurance. And that is the promise that all of the retirees here and all of the hundreds of retirees that are in the street that couldn't make it here today, uh, that they relied on. Um, and it is, I think, unheard of in, in, in the case law for there to be a promise made, an unrebutted promise made for 57 years. That is just an enormous amount of time. Everyone here, I believe, that predates their, their employment, uh, that, that, that was throughout their employment, throughout their retirement. They built their lives around this basic promise that they, they sacrificed higher wages. They sacrificed, in some of them, their health. There's a lot of people here who were former first responders uh, or they were educators who, uh, who, who are suffering, but they had one thing that other people in the private sector didn't. They had the promise of top-notch health care in the form of public Medicare and city-funded Medicare supplemental insurance. Would you agree with counsel that the contours of that promise could vary over time? That promise was clear and unambiguous and was verbatim the same from the 1960s uh, through today. Even though the plans in place it, it, is, it, 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 it is true. Our position, as much as, as I think the retirees here love their senior care plan, uh, our position is not that, that the specific benefits in senior care are frozen in time forever. Senior care is a plan. The benefits it offers are benefits within that plan. Medicare plus supplemental insurance is not a plan. It's not a plan benefit. It's an entire health care paradigm. And what it does is it makes health care, uh, it takes it away from the private for-profit uh, you know, profit, uh, you know, motive that exists in Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage uh, is a dangerous uh, alternative to Medicare. It makes the insurance well, companies think, billions of dollars. I think what we need to do is stay on point, which yeah. is whether there, whether there was a basis, and not just a basis for, but a, an establishment of the elements of the promissory estoppel. You know, obviously it could have a very significant policy debate as to the, the benefits or drawbacks of various plans. Uh, on that, that point, what, how do you respond to your friend's point in his brief that promissory estoppel is rarely appropriate as against a, a governmental entity? So the, the, the scenario where that comes up, where it's disfavored against the government, is a scenario that's very different from here. When that comes up and, and courts talk about how you don't want to stop the government, it's because the government has to comply with its statutory duties. And you don't want to bind the government from complying with a statutory mandate. So, and in fact, in one of the cases we cite Brennan, there was a statute that said that police officers who, who worked in New York had to live in New York, and they had been told that they could live in elsewhere. And normally in that situation, absent injustice, you want to allow the city to enforce the statute, even if someone lower down in city government just wasn't aware that there was a statute that, that prohibited their promise. Here, there's no statute that, that says that the city has to force these retirees into Medicare Advantage. But even if there were, then it would be like Brennan. And in Brennan, this court said that the city was stopped from enforcing that state law because people had uh, moved out of state based on the assurances of other people within the city government that they could do so. So if, if a stopple was warranted in Brennan, I think there's no question that it's, that, that it's definitely required here. Council, it seems if one takes um, Ms. Barrios, Barrios Paoli's affidavit at face value, it appears that it was not an aberration, but really a, st a city policy of recruiting people based on this promise. 
I couldn't find any promissory estoppel cases offhand so far that really address where there's a city policy that's the basis of the estoppel. Can you point me to any that do that? I, I think usually, I mean, that would obviously be an extra factor that would that would militate in favor of enforcing estoppel. I think usually it's you have you know people in working for the, the city uh, who make a promise and they're doing so without necessarily some formal policy. Here, what does, one of the many things that distinguishes this case is you actually have a city policy that was enforced for six decades uh, that came from the highest levels of city government that said, in order to attract people to work for the city, to risk their lives for the city, we want to make sure that even though they're not getting paid that much, and even though the job might at sometimes be very stressful and very difficult, we're going to make sure that in their retirement, when they're elderly and when they're just disabled, they will get the best health care that we can provide. And then what happens here is exactly what Mayor Adams said when he was running for office. This is a bait and switch. They were all baited into working for city government. And what was the context of that? He was running for office and he was asked at the time, there is some talk of potentially uh, moving retirees to a Medicare Advantage plan. And he was very clear. He said, I am opposed because I, there's, we don't want to do a bait and switch that would violate the understanding and agreement these retirees had with the city. And he also said that forcing retirees into Medicare Advantage would, quote, traumatize our retirees. And there's a reason why he said that. He changed his mind, to be sure, once he came into office. But I would submit the reason he changed his mind, it has nothing to do with the city budget. It's because all of a sudden he realized he would have access, you know, with, with no oversight or accountability, uh, to millions and millions of dollars. Uh, Does that address where these funds would go? The uh, question that yeah, the, 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 in, in, the, in the testimony of the director of the, uh, the uh, office, the director of the city uh, independent budget office, um, it, there is a specific uh, fund uh, that that would be controlled uh, by the mayor and union leaders. And that's why you have this unusual alliance in this case between two parties that are usually not allied. You have the city and union leaders, and they basically sold out these retirees. Uh, they are going to make millions of dollars on the backs of elderly and disabled uh, retirees who spent their lives working and sacrificing for all of us in the city. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you, Your you. Honors. You have two minutes, Councilor. Um, what you heard is fantasy. The, the, the stabilization fund is not a new thing. The money will go. I want to correct my answer. It is earmarked. It will go to the stabilization fund. It is not a new thing. It has funded benefits for retirees and actives for years. Who has control over that? It, it is jointly administered by the city and the MLC, but, but it is not a slush fund. It does not line the pockets of the mayor or anyone else. It provides benefits to employees and retirees like drug rider benefits, chemotherapy and injectable benefits, welfare, uh, not, orphan. It doesn't go into the general fund. Well, not go into the general fund, but will fund other benefits. Funny, I thought earlier you said it did go into the general fund. I said it, I did not, wasn't aware that it was earmarked. I'm trying to correct ah, that answer that thank it you. is, I but, the, but that is, but that those are, those are, it, it, my point holds, which is that uh, anytime there is a, a budget, a question of budgeting, if you, if you don't save the money, you either cut something, in this case, it'll be the the benefits that are provided by the stabilization fund, including to retirees, or you raise money another way. All of that is true. But it is not a slush fund. And, and what I would submit is that the reason the mayor, once he took office, changed his view is because when you have the responsibility of navigating challenging times, we all know healthcare in this country is exploding cost-wise. The city has engaged in efforts to save money, not on the backs of retirees, but by adjusting active employee care for eight, nine years with the cooperation and assistance of the MLC. When you have that responsibility, you understand that sometimes difficult choices need to be made to navigate difficult times. And, and, and he I, also has to, has to play the hand that he's dealt when he comes into office. And so if a particular set of promises or, or policies were in place long before he got into office, he still may be stuck with those. He may want to take measures prospectively but I don't know that, that I hear what you're saying as far as his need to adjust to changing times and changing dynamics, but I don't know that that get, gets any executive around or, or, or legislature around that which the die that was cast by their predecessors. I, I would agree with that. But there what I would say what's notably absent from my friend's argument is any grappling with the case law and promissory estoppel. The Devlin case, the Abruscato case, the Emerling case, where what you see is explicit promises of vesting, lifetime, until death, 
language completely absent here. There's no other case where you have a document where where there's an admission that everything else changed, but one thing, but a, but a position that one thing couldn't, and there's nothing in that passage that says here's the one thing that cannot change. There is, and the last thing I'd say, the last major omission, the Donahue versus Cuomo case. It is worth reading that case and reading what the Court of Appeals said just two years ago in the context of understanding the collective bargaining agreement and thinking about what that would mean for the promissory estoppel claim that the petition. You can rest assured we'll pay attention to that case, counsel. I, I, I understand. Thank you, Your Honor. Decock versus New York State Division of Housing. So that was oral arguments on the Bentkowski case. Um, I know you probably have a million questions. Feel free to put them below and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Um, so basically what the city was saying was that they didn't really have evidence and didn't think there was anything that was necessary to put any evidence in the case to refute the Lillian Ber L Lilium Berrios Paoli affidavit that was filed um, in our case when we first started this a year ago. So um, her document was very powerful because she expressed exactly the promise that we all remember and the city is choosing to deny or ignore. Um, and I'm glad that the justices, Justice Gessmer was very tough on our uh, attorney, Richard Deering, in trying to say to him, you didn't think it was important to refute any evidence um, that was put in by that affidavit, that there was a promise that was made. And she knows it because she she also made that promise to people, especially having been a deputy mayor and, and running HRA. So he had nothing to respond to that. Also of interest was the stabilization fund. It was interesting to see that but of all this time, the city of New York has no idea about the stabilization fund, that it's been misused, that they've been using it like a slush fund, which has been our allegation. I know sometimes um, the independent budget office calls it, a, I think, a rainy day fund. We choose to say what it really is, is a slush fund, because it is misused according to, to the agreement which founded that fund, that it is supposed to be used for health benefits. And it's also misleading when Mr. Deering say it's, it's used for other benefits, especially for retirees and employees. The only benefit that a Medicare-eligible retiree gets from that fund is if they have a welfare fund, they get a welfare fund benefit, prescription, vision, or dental. If they are um, if they are not in a union or, or in a union that doesn't have a welfare fund, they get nothing from it. The only people that benefit from the health insurance stabilization fund are active workers and under 65 retirees. Those are the ones that get the PICA, the chemotherapy, the asthma, or, and the premium difference for any premium cost between HIP and, HIP and GHI prep plans. A Medicare eligible retiree gets nothing else. So it's disingenuous for the city to be arguing that point. Um, so... We're going to hope uh, that justice prevails in this case, fingers crossed, and as soon as we know something, we'll let you know. Have a great day. Any questions, guys, put them below.